See, we just took an offering to give to him, but I like to give out. So, you know, I gave regular size candy bars last time. I have a Kit Kat and a big size. So anybody want to stop faster? Come on up. Come on up. See, you should jump first. So, say, uh, look. See, she's going to get her first choice. So, so uh, what's your friend for me? What is this? Um, first off, what's your name? Tanya? All right. And what's your friend? A bracelet. And what's it for? Why do you why do you why do you wear bracelets? Because you like to. Tell me about what's what's so special about this bracelet? Your grandpa and your grandma. So this is not even yours. Boy, you just just. Oh, but it's yours too. But your grandma and grandpa gave it to you, right? And it, it was was is it like a token of their love? You know, I know I know a heavenly father that gave us something that that. Uh, that we can never give back. We can never give him enough to equate the love that he's given us, and that was his son. He gave us his son. And just kind of like this bracelet where it goes round and round, doesn't stop, doesn't start or doesn't stop, that's, that's, the, that's the power of, of the, the love that God has for us. It never stops. Do you want a Kit Kat or a Hershey's? Kit Kat. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a choice between a Hershey's or a Hershey's. All right, what you got? You got a phone. Oh. Is it on? Is the batteries are dead? Oh, the batteries. Oh, look at there. Hold on, let me see if I can do this. First off, there it is. That's one. Want to do a selfie? Get in there. Get in there. Where's she going? Where's she going? Where's she going? See, she doesn't know that um, I had to teach her how to break into a phone. Um, but see, what, what's the phone for? Huh? To play on. How things have changed. What else can you do with a phone? Call somebody. What else can you do with a phone? Someone said call somebody. Talk to people. You know, we talked about last week talking to people. Um, nice try. You guys are going to have to try a little bit harder. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go back down and small candy bars. You're going to have to. The third Sunday of every month. There's the big ones coming out. Um, but we, we, we talked last week about talking to God and how we have that open line of communication. We talked about the words that come out of our mouth, but we also have that open line of communication. Unlike a cell phone where it dies, our line of communication with the Lord never does. Um, this, this week, as we continue, if you have God's Word, I encourage you to look, open up to James chapter 3. We are working our way through James. Last week, we talked about disciplining the tongue. This one is about wisdom. And it's one thing to talk about what wisdom is. We need to know what it is. It's a lot more than knowledge. You can have all the knowledge in the world. Doesn't mean anything. Wisdom is the application of that knowledge. Now James in this today's passage implies that everybody is wise. Y'all taking notes? Everybody is wise. Everyone is wise. We all have some kind of wisdom to share. Now that that's out of the way, we can go to lunch, right? You're dismissed? No? Not that easy, is it? Wait, there are two types of wisdom. Just like we have the free will to choose to follow Jesus or not to follow Jesus, there are two types of wisdom that gives us free will to choice to choose over. Wisdom of the word and wisdom of the world. That one little L that slid right in their middle just makes all the difference. Which one do you have? On July 6, 2011, a hiker, his name is Brian Matayoshi, he was attacked by a female grizzly bear near the Watapi Lake Trail in Yellowstone National Park. He and his wife were visiting the park as, of, as do hundreds of thousands of people every year. Apparently, they surprised the mother grizzly and her cubs. The National Park Service issued a statement saying in an attempt to defend the perceived threat to her cubs, a bear attacked and fatally wounded the man. Though the man did not intend to harm the bearer of her cubs, she did not know that and responded according to her nature with fatal results. What does that have to do with wisdom? It's as dangerous as it is to cross paths with a mother bear and her cubs. The Bible tells us it's even more dangerous to cross paths with a fool. And see, the opposite of what worldly wisdom gives us is foolish wisdom. In Proverbs 17, 12, quote, Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool bent on folly. 
not my words, but his. Um, there are two different types of wisdom. We're going to look at this at, at the today. Um, we got somebody back there actually playing. Good deal. I don't have to fool with it. I'm going to take this off. My PowerPoint person, you're in control. If we're looking at James 3, verse 7, with verse 13, wisdom of the world is demonic. We say that again. Nobody likes hearing that word. That's a rough word, isn't it? Wisdom of the world is demonic. Starting with verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, their, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. There goes James again talking about deeds. He's talking about us actually doing it. I need to take it over. That's right. Yes, there we go. Verse 14, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly. Unspiritual and demonic. Earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. Those are his words. Worldly wisdom, it actually yields three different results if we're looking at this scripture today. According to James, worldly wisdom yields envy. What is envy? Envy defined as our displeasure taken in someone else's good fortune. Or a pleasure taking in someone else's unfortunate circumstances. Reverend Ron McManus is one of the, kind of like the equivalent to our general superintendent, but over with the Church of Christ. He says, bitterness is like drinking a poison that waits for the other person to die. A proverb tells us that a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes our bones rot. That's out of 1430 in Proverbs. See, envy is that thing that starts in the middle inside of us, deep. No one can see it when, it when it's first given birth. No one knows that we're envious. Man, I don't know about y'all. I'm sure that y'all have never had to deal with envy, right? I have. So if y'all can't testify, that's okay. I've had to deal with it. I remember as, as, a, as a young couple with my bride and us praying about having kids and seeing all these young kids that are just being irresponsible in there having kids left and right. We couldn't have kids. Tens of thousands of dollars of therapy later, still couldn't have kids. A doctor actually at Vanderbilt said, if you want to have kids, you better adopt. Now that's a harsh word to hear. It's not fair. Boy, was my envy. It, it, it boiled over. We're going to get to what it turns into in a, in a moment, but that envy, it starts as a cancer, and it eats ourselves way out. It, it, it ate myself out to the point where my involvement in children's ministry at the time was just, I was just going through the motions. I was teaching third grade boys at the time in Sunday school. Couldn't stand the sight of kids. How about that for moms and dads? Your kid's got a Sunday school teacher that doesn't like looking at kids. I didn't, I didn't advertise it. But man, I'm sure I look like a scowl on my face. It's harsh to look at scowls when, you, when you're in church, isn't it? Boy, that envy just started to boil out, and it's like a cancer that eats from the inside out. Like Proverbs says, it says it makes the bones rot. It makes the bones rot. See, that envy leads to our second one, self-ambition. Self-ambition defined as a promotion of our own needs above others' needs. So if we look at it, it says, for where you have envy and self-ambition, this is going to equate to making a god out of oneself. Oh, that's not, that's not right, though, Pastor. I don't worship myself. If you're only thinking about your own needs, yes, that's exactly what making your God out of something is. That's exactly. It's a self-ambition we have is when we place our own desire above everybody else around us. It, may, it actually puts our needs and our desires over the God that calls us. I think this needs to happen. I think that needs to happen. I don't care what you have to say. I think. I, I, I. It's that, it's that one little word that, that causes that envy that started out with. If you really think about what envy is, it's because we are mad. It's not fair that I am treated this way. And then we, it develops into that self-ambition. I had to dabble with a little bit of self-ambition myself. I was the man with all the power. I'd walk into a retail store. I had your, I had your termination paper right here. All you had to do was sign it. And quite frankly, I didn't care if you signed it. You were going to leave or get arrested. So you either sign it or do some time. That was, man, I, I, it was all about me climbing that ladder. 
See, our self-ambition makes a God out of ourselves. It puts our desires above the Lord's. You know, everything that, that James is talking about focuses right back to what Jesus said when he, was, when he was questioned by the Pharisees. What is the most important commandment? Well, the first one is to love your God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. See, what happens when we follow the worldly wisdom? Our own desires move to the top of that list. See, Jesus, the way he explained it, is no different than what it is in the, in the Old Testament. The first four commandments deal strictly about our relationship with God and putting God first. The last six deal strictly with how we put the relationship with others second. If God is first and others are second, where do we fall? Third. See, what happens with worldly wisdom is we moved up that list. We become more important than other people. Oh, but I still put God first. Oh, not if it's all about what I want. And we put ourselves before God. We put ourselves before His desire and His will. See, he start, James starts off this, this whole passage with, by deeds done in humility. See, when we're humble and do our deeds, it's not about us, is it? It's not about us. And the third thing it leads to is disorder. Disorder leads to chaos. Well, that's, well, that's self ambition. Disorder, disorder leads to chaos. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that God is a God of peace, which is the exact order, opposite of what disorder and chaos brings. Think about it. We have people just running around all in the church, and someone's trying to preach. I wouldn't. I'd probably run away from them, to be honest with you, because that's, that's, that's the mentality where I'm at. But if people run around and they're running in all different directions, not really much is happening, is it? Um, you have disorder that leads to chaos. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that God has got a peace which is the exact opposite. Paul spoke to the church in Galatia, uh, from Galatians 5.26, and says, Let us not become conceited, self-centered, provoking one another, bring ourselves above other things, envying one another. Where do we hear with just that? We just heard that scripture, didn't we? See, those, those actions allow us to, that lead straight into disorder. Um, and I, I love the practical example. I'm, I'm still trying to give an idea and get back on the basketball bandwagon. I'm sorry, Indiana, it's not happening. I'm still a football fan. I will always be a football fan. I'm really trying to get on the basketball, but um, I have, I, it, it's just not me. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at NFL, and I, I got my hopes up when I was scanning the channels yesterday. I saw XFL, and I was like, oh. But if in the NFL we have 32 different teams, they all have a game plan, right? Their game plan is to do what? Get to the Super Bowl. Only two of them were successful, were they? Only one of them were successful in winning the Super Bowl. Furthermore, if they have, they all have the different, probably have different game plans. They have different ideas of what will lead them to success. If you look at an NFL team that's got at any given point 11 different players on the field. Well, let's look at it at the base level. If every one of those 11 players have a different game plan, have a different idea of what they need to do on that certain play, what's that field going to look like? Chaos. Chaos. They're not going to win, are they? See, what happens, what makes a successful football team is they're all on the same game plan, a successful game plan. They all think it's successful. But they're all on the same game plan. If you will watch, regardless of what you feel about NFL or the different players or what the players have done in the past, listen to the interviews. What helped you contribute to the win? It was a team win. Man, I had this, this protection of that. It wasn't me. The, the, the humble players are the ones who would be like, it was a team effort. It's because we all were on the same page. They were all on the same game plan. Why are churches, some churches successes and some churches failures? They're not on the right game plan. They're in a chaotic mode where people want to have control over where the church does and what the church does and where the church goes. It's chaos. Why do some churches succeed? It's because they're on, the, they're on the right game plan. We have a game plan. It's up to us to follow it. There's only one plan to salvation. I don't care what anybody other world view says. There are other world religions that say there's different routes to salvation. I'm sorry. 
There's no one who comes to the Father except by me. That was Jesus' words. The one game plan that works. The other wisdom, the other side of wisdom is wisdom of the world. It is in heavenly origins. It allows us to face trials with joy. I wonder where we heard that back in James 1, verse 5. Consider joy, my brothers, when you face trials and tribulations. With verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial and sincere. I think we talked about the sentiment of partiality a couple weeks ago, right? Peacemakers sow in peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, the wisdom of the word, it also yields three different results. And again, it's good to know the results because that's what we see right now. The first result is purity. Um, in this case, in this context, it's, also, it's all about spiritual purity. This applies to everybody. I love this inclusiveness of this scripture. The purity, and James is talking, he's talking to everybody. It doesn't require if you're educated. It doesn't require if you have a seminary degree. It doesn't require if you have just a lowly Bible college degree like I do. No matter where it comes from, it's that purity that controls your thoughts. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, lovely, commendable, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, think on these things. See, the purity that, that we have, the result from a word wisdom, the wisdom that comes from the word, is that we have pure thoughts. If we compare that with the very first thing, it's, it's that envy is not too pure, is it? It starts out and, and just like nails on a chalkboard, just gets louder and louder and it just tears away at us. See, on the flip side of that, that purity is that holiness. It's pure. doesn't mean it's perfect. Uh, some of us need to work on that. We'll get to that in a moment. The second one is it creates right relationships with, you ready? God, others, and self. I wonder where self landed on that list. It started off with God, and this again is not Daryl's word. We're looking at verse 17. It's, it's first of all pure, then it's peace loving. See, that word peace loving is referring to that God of peace title that, that we, you know, I, I, I go into a lot of the older Nazarene churches and They'll have big banners, you know, God of love, God of power, God of peace, um, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom, those, those big banners that are, I'm not a big fan of the banners, but that's okay. They they're refer to that title, the God of peace. You love peace, with a capital P. It's talking about God, peace loving. Secondly, secondly, it says that it's considerate. We are considerate to others, people's needs. So we love God first. We're, 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 it's all about loving God first. Then, Because that gives us a right relationship with Him. It gives us a right relationship with others. Then it talks about ourselves. I mean, what, what word does it say in ourselves? Submissive. Can you all say that? Submissive? That's a hard word to say. You know? We don't like saying submissive. That puts ourselves last. That puts ourselves last. Submissive is one of those words that doesn't matter if you're in your 70s. It says, pick up a bass guitar and learn. Submissive is one of those words that says, I don't care if you're comfortable in a bigger church. Go to the small one and be worship. Submissive is, guess what? I'm going I'm to I'm take away your work on Sunday so, so you can go to church. Submissive is saying, it doesn't matter where you want to go, Daryl. You're going, to, you're going to Indiana. Submissive is following his desires and looking for others, and putting others, other people's thoughts first, being considerate. And it gives us, I, I use the, the, the saying that we, we're all square with the house. That's what we do in the beginning. We, we focus our relationship right with him first so that everything that we sing, everything that we pray, everything that we give in tithes and offering goes straight to him so he can be magnified. You know, when I give my tithe and offering, it's not so the church can pay the light bill. It's out of obedience. So when I give extra or over and above that, that's, I want him to magnify it. I want him to be glorified in that. And I want to give the, the church board leadership an opportunity to use tools to say, hey, go and reach your, your community. It's all about him and not about us. Last thing it does is it creates peacemakers. 
I love peacemakers. Uh, peacemakers, the first thing that comes to mind is that, uh, that blessed are the peacemakers. We are? Exactly. But see, there's peacemakers. I, I, when I first saw that, that word, I, I didn't go straight to the, to the beatitude. My son is seven, and he's starting to learn what compound words are. Compound words are two words put together make one word. Sometimes they make a word that's different. Sometimes they make a word that's complementary. But if you look at what peace and makers, we talked about how God, that purity brings peace. But the second word of that is makers. It takes effort and energy. And some of us are given that gift. We have someone here in this room that when they walk into the room, they bring a spirit of peace with them. I'm not going to call them out because a lot of times they don't like that. But I've got a brother that's preaching right now down in uh, Pensacola. As my, the, my old senior pastor is on his way down to Cuba, I believe. He should be there already um, for another missions trip. I've got another mentor of mine that's preaching today. And Pastor Terry's one of those men that, that he walks into the room and it's automatically peaceful. I wish I had that gift. I just don't. I'm sarcastic. I got that gift all day long. But Pastor Terry walks into that room and he emits peace. He's the type of person that when he can talk to me and even when he calls me out on something, it's such a peaceful and loving manner. But, I, man, it sets an urgency, man. i got to fix this. I don't want to make him upset. If I'm making him upset, I know I'm making him, the Lord, upset because this man has got peace written all through his spirit. The rest of us, though, we have to make peace. We have to put effort and energy into it. There's action that requires that peace. It must be made. It requires thought and effort. Some people, again, have that natural, but it's that fruit that comes from a right relationship with God. Does that mean that I don't have a good relationship with God because I'm not just one of the fruits that I don't have? A lot of times those peacemakers don't like speaking in public. Um, Pastor Terry is a phenomenal speaker. You know, I, I have no idea what kind of nerves he goes through. I go through a lot of nerves right before I speak in public, but it's one of those gifts that God's given to me. If I handed this mic over to somebody else in, in the congregation, they'd be like, forget it, Terry, this is the last time you're going to see me. Jack, want to preach a sermon next week? I don't think so. See, we are given different gifts. But see, even though I have a gift of, of speaking in front of people, and sometimes I get nervous, sometimes it shows, sometimes it doesn't, I still have to make the sermon. There's a lot of work that goes into making the sermon. Just like making peace requires that much effort. If peace doesn't come naturally to you, when's the last time you put effort and energy and time into making that peace? And one of the things that this passage was missing was an end result, an answer. It's implied here. And I wanted to ask that question, where do we get wisdom? Now, I could have gone anywhere in, in, the book of, in the book of Proverbs. As a matter of fact, I love Proverbs. We all know the story of Solomon. See, Solomon was this king that, he was the son of David, that David did so well in God's eyes. And God said, you know what, your dad made me so happy. Your dad brought me so much pleasure, I'm going to give you whatever you want. He's a birthright. He inherited it. A huge gift from God. And he takes it and in all humility he says, Lord, I need the wisdom to lead your people so I don't mess up. It's one of those things that I pray. So I could have gone anywhere in Proverbs. Yet I go to Job because I get something out of Job every time I look. We're looking at Job 28 verses 20 and 23. Where then does peace come from? Where does wisdom come from? 23 says, God understands the way to it and he alone knows where it dwells. If the Lord himself was the only place that knows peace, or the only place that knows where wisdom is found, why don't we go to him? This is God's word. We can know everything that's in this book, frontwards and backwards, and not have a bit of wisdom. I'm going to tell you right now, the enemy knows every word that's in this, that's in this book. He knows it in every translation. He knows it in every version whether it's NIV, King James, NASB, the enemy knows it because he was around when it was written. He knows this. That doesn't mean that he has a right relationship with God. His wisdom is worldly. We live in a world that, that says, take care of me first. Take care of the number one first. 
Check out number one first. Let's give we the word says to dig into this and let it transform you. Not to the patterns of this world, but to his. What type of wisdom do you have? Where do you source your wisdom from? See, this is all about living in our faith. Does your word, does the Bible enter your home? Does it gather dust? Oh, but I don't have it. I, it's, I've got it on my phone. Yeah, but every once in a while you get these little updates that say, hey, do you want to clean up some apps that have been used? Does the Bible app show up on that one? The same, same thing. It's no different than dust on a book. There's some books in the, in, the, in the library back there that have dust on them already. There are some that rarely get to see the shelf because they're always out. Does your app on your phone, is it so frequently used that your phone says, yeah, well, you might want to clean up some space. Maybe you're in a, you're in a time frame where no food's being produced. Maybe you're running low on that wisdom. See, the one thing that I love about this, the title, one of the titles about this book is called The Living Word. If we allow it to live in our lives, it produces a wisdom that it transcends what the world is trying to put out. There are two types of wisdom. Every person in this room is wise. The type of wisdom is dependent upon you. Where do you source it from? Where do you source it from? We're going we're gonna to go to the Lord in prayer. And this is between you and your maker. It's between you and the Father. Father, we thank you so much for your word and how your word is living. Your word offers wisdom. Lord, but there's some times where the world wisdom dips into our hearts. There's times where we become envious and that envy just, just sprouts and it starts to fruit. It's a, it's a nasty fruit. It's a, it's a rancid fruit. It puts ourselves first and allows to, it leads to chaos and disorder. Lord, you are the only one that can purify that, that, that wisdom. Give us a hunger and a, a thirst to dive into this word so that our wisdom comes from you and you alone. You've given us the great game plan. You've given us a game plan that, that leads to righteousness. But it's up to us to put time and effort into it. So help us to surround ourselves with those that, that have the biblical wisdom, the wisdom of the word. Lord, I thank you for those that you've placed in my life that I can turn to. Those mentors here and the mentors in, in Florida that I can call at a moment's known and say, hey, this is what just happened in my life and I need your mentorship. I need your wisdom because I know your wisdom comes from the word and not from the world around us. Help us to take the word's wisdom over the world's even when it's harder. Help us, give us the courage to follow what the word says. Help us to be able to turn the other cheek, because that's harder to do than a lot easier to do with the eye for the eye thing. Both come from the word. But help us to put ourselves third. Help us to put you first, others second, and ourselves third. Help us to be able to not only have the word, the wisdom of the word, but to have it be evident to those around us. Lord, we give it all to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. A benediction today. Wisdom's around us. It's everywhere. It's up to you where you take it in. Dig into his word. Now, I'll put a, put a challenge out there when I first started, started here. Anytime that I say one word that doesn't line up directly with this word of God, that door is open. You can come to me any time of day. I've got a problem with what you preached on. Guess what? I want to get it right because I want the wisdom to be pure. I want this wisdom to be focused on him first, me last. Seek your wisdom from here. 
Not from anybody here on the pulpit, anybody on the television. Keep it from here. Go in peace.